Another episode of Words of Grace starts now. Featuring a new, grace-filled message each week as Acts 433 Church brings the gospel to you through the teaching ministry of Dr. Matthew Webster. We are the Dreamers. Part 2 begins now as we will, for the very first time, explore in depth someone's biblical dream. And I thought, what better place than to start with looking at the God-given dreams of Daniel. So we're going to head to Daniel chapter 1, starting in verse 17. And I am so glad that you have joined us this week for this one. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Now, what four young men are we talking about? Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. Now, you're probably saying, I've heard of Daniel before, but who are the other three? I'm sure you've heard of them before, probably referred to by a different name. Scripture tells us that the chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. And that's Daniel 1.7. And so if you are new to watching our channel, and perhaps you're new to the Christian faith, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the guys who were threatened and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. But Jesus was with them, and they were unharmed. Why do you think that the enemy tried to change their names? It's so they would forget their identity of who God made them to be. Check this out. Daniel means God is my judge, and it was changed to Belteshazzar. Bel, which is a name for the various Babylonian gods, and to Shazar means to protect his life. Hananiah means God is favored. And he's changed to Shadrach, under the command of the Babylonian god, Aku, the god of the moon. Mishael is who is like God. And he's changed to Meshach, who is like Aku, the Babylonian god of the moon. Azariah is God has helped. He's changed, his name is changed to Abednego, servant of Nebu, the Babylonian god of wisdom. Their names were changed to try and obscure who God created them to be. God's favor, as we see, as we see in verse 17, is upon their lives. Now, before verse 17, Daniel and the other three have a request. The request is that they would not eat the choice meat and the wine that is being given to them. And it's being given to them by the king. Their names have already been changed. And the, the goal is to obscure who they are and to try to lead others to worship and glorify the gods of Babylon. Now, the food has been sacrificed to these pagan gods. But their God-honoring choice begins to set the stage to reveal who the true God is. This is a risky choice that they made. Uh, and the official will tell Daniel in verse 10, he says, I'm afraid of the Lord my king, who has assigned your food and drink. And so why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would have my head because of you. So Daniel, who the Lord has given this knowledge to, he has an answer to ease the king's servant who's afraid that if he doesn't follow exactly the king's orders, that he'll be killed. And so here's Daniel's plan. He says, let's try it out for 10 days. This is verse 12. What a brilliant idea. This isn't long enough. Uh, for those who have been on a diet before know that 10 days isn't long enough to be too drastic of a change. But it's enough time that you should start to see some results happening. So verse 13 of Daniel 1, it says, Then compare our appearance with those of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance to what you see. 
So they do this. And the result is, well, here's a before and after picture. Oops, that's actually from my Facebook feed. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So recap, a little bit of history here. Daniel is only 15 years old when, when him and his friends are taken captive. And the Bible says that in a short time, he refused to compromise with the Babylonian system. He refused to eat the food offered to their gods. They wanted to remain true to their God. So when we get to verse 17, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. We can marvel at such wisdom at such an early age, but God had already given him wisdom even before this happened. What is taking place is purposeful. And I must remind us all about our lives in Christ is the same statement as these four young men. You have the favor of God because Christ lives in you. Begin to see yourself in Christ, who is always flowing with divine wisdom, always in control of the situation, and the same wisdom that flows in him will flow in and through you. But of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. So whenever situations in your life are puzzling, remember who your wisdom is and where it flows from. I've been purposefully teaching my kids to ask God for wisdom. My oldest daughter, Ava, was having some struggles in her math class. And I would go over the homework with her and try to help her understand on get ready for the test that was coming. And it seemed like uh, she was making some simple mistakes over and over again. And of course, there is wisdom in studying and receiving help whenever we can get it. And so we, what we did is we also enrolled her in tutoring. But there is a biblical principle here. I began to pray with her and I told her, before you even put your name on that test paper, I want you to stop and I want you to thank God that he is with you and that he will grant you wisdom and receive his peace as you begin to take your test. She did that. And the simple mistakes that she had made before in the past, she stopped making. And she said, this is easy. She started to understand it so well that she went ahead in lessons and she actually learned what was coming next. And she said, that's easy too. And so we could really gain a lot to be humble and know what we don't know and ask God for wisdom. When Solomon was a young man, God appeared to him in a dream at Gibeon, and he said, Ask, what shall I give you? 1 Kings 3, 5. Now I want to show you how humble Solomon was. He told God in 1 Kings 3, 7 through 9, he says, I'm a little child. I don't know how to go out or to come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Solomon said that he was like a little child who didn't even know how to go out or come in, let alone rule God's people. But he was humble enough to see his need for God's wisdom and to ask him for it. Like Solomon, we need to humble ourselves too. We need to see our need for God's wisdom and ask him for it. The Bible says in James 1, 5, that if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of, ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If any of you lacks wisdom, I, that's where I see myself in this place, lacking wisdom all the time. And that is why my prayer is, God, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Christ to serve you better.
because we all need wisdom to overcome the challenges that we all face in life. But wisdom does not come unless we see our need for it. An advantage that Daniel had and, and the others is Daniel's only 15. And so he knows that he doesn't know a lot. <laughs> and so their actions throughout this book are humble. And Daniel knows where his wisdom comes from. So right, right after we learn about the Lord giving Daniel and the other three wisdom and understanding, we're going to see it immediately come into play uh, with his actions and responses to this very powerful king. Now, this might be obvious, but how would you know that God has given you knowledge and wisdom and understanding unless a situation arises where you would need it? <laughs> and that knowledge and understanding would have to be at your disposal. Verse 18 says that at the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's service. So already doors are opening up for them because of the understanding and knowledge that God has given them. It says in verse 20 that in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters uh, in this whole kingdom. Remember, they're 15 years of age. They don't have a lot of life experience, but he's found them to be 10 times better than people who are considered the most knowledgeable, wise people in all the land. So we see wisdom and understanding being used for God's glory. But it also mentioned that Daniel was given something else in verse 17. Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Every single gift God has given to you in your life, he has a plan to use it for your good and for his glory. Guess what Daniel chapter 2 starts off with then? The king has a dream. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and they stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. These dreams were from God, and he did what we still do today. Let's see if astrology can answer it for me. And so, verse 4, let's go to a fortune teller, Madame Clairvoyant. Well, good luck with that. So the stakes are so high, and the king is smart enough to know that he doesn't want to get shined on with, some, with any old answer. He really wants to know the truth behind his dreams. And so the king replies to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you'll receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and then interpret it for me. They can't do this, and so they try to stall. In verse 7, once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time, because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping that the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers in verse 10 answer the king, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. These people are wicked pagan workers of the devil who have profited off of their mastery in dark arts, black magic, and what they're doing here is they're speaking their native language of, the fa of their father, the devil. 
When they said that no one can interpret your dreams, they are spiritually blind, and what they speak is not true. But these dreams from God, they can be interpreted. And so I wanted to tell you that the God-given dreams that you have can also be interpreted as well. God doesn't give specific dreams for no purpose or interpretation. You see, this made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. You see, the words of the enemy, they deceive, they steal from, they destroy, and they lead to death. That's what John 10.10 10 tells us. So the decree in verse 13 was issued to put these wise men to death. And men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Remember, they're lumped in together with all the wise men in the kingdom. You see, the king, he isn't playing. All these wise guys, they can't, they can't help me. So what's the point in even having them? They all got to go. They've all been deceiving me and tricking me uh, into believing that they're smarter than they are. But the word of the Lord brings life and salvation for the lost. And so when Daniel finds out about the king needing an interpretation of his dreams and that no one can do it, what does Daniel do? See, we read the story of this man's life, and Daniel hasn't been told by God that he could do what the king needs up until this point. He doesn't know that he has this ability from God to interpret dreams. He's never done it before. You and I will face times in our lives where we'll perceive a huge problem that we don't know how we are ever going to solve it. But God does. You need his wisdom in your life. So Daniel in verses 17 through 19, it says that he returned to his house and he explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Instead of running directly to the king, Daniel ran to the king of kings, and he got three of his friends to join him in prayer. He went to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He went to God has favored, who is like God, and God has helped. That's three pretty good, friendly reminders that he went to the right place. You see, God wants us to go after wisdom. In the book of Proverbs, God tells us wisdom is the principal thing, Proverbs 4, 7. We're not to go after riches, but when we, when we have wisdom, all the things we seek will follow after us, including honor and length of days. So never, ever make riches your goal. Wisdom comes from the Lord. If you lack wisdom, simply ask God for it, just like Daniel did. He'll give it to you liberally and without reproach. The truth is, he has already given you wisdom when he gave his son, Jesus Christ, who became for us wisdom from God. So when we are facing a challenge at work, and we don't know how to resolve it. Say, Jesus, you are my wisdom. I thank you that you will provide me with the very best solution. There is no daunting task that cannot be accomplished when God's wisdom prevails. God has the wisdom for every single situation that you will ever face. And his wisdom I can testify to this. His wisdom will carry you through and give you good success without having all of the worry. So Daniel will praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let me read this to you. This is Daniel's praise to God, and may your hearts rejoice at these very words. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He de deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. 
You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. The spirit of Daniel is humbled by what the Lord has done for him. So as this God-given gifting opens doors for him, all glory goes to God. Solomon, the wise son of David, wrote the following. And I wonder if he's actually thinking about Daniel when he writes this in Proverbs 18, 16. He says, a gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. As you and I use our God-given talents for the kingdom, it is going to open wide the doors of opportunity for us. It'll bring us into the company of great men and women. Now, I'm almost out of time. So we got to get to the interpretation of the dream. But first, it says that Daniel went to Arak, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. You see, this this is God's plan. God's plan is a plan of salvation. And what he has blessed Daniel with will go on to bless uh, the entire kingdom. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. This is like when Joseph was put in a position in Egypt and all the things he went through. And then he says in Genesis 50, 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is being done, the saving of many lives. You see, the plan of the Lord is a plan of salvation. So Daniel replies in verse 27, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or div diviner can explain to the king the mystery that he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. Daniel is about to not only interpret the dream, but tell the king what he dreamed about. You want to talk about proving that you are not making this stuff up. And I love that Daniel is giving God all the glory because this will provide the opportunity for the nation to believe in Daniel's God. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue. It's awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain, and it filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we'll interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion, and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beast of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. And finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. For iron breaks and it smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, uh, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with bake, baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. 
It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. And so I have a picture of the statue, and I don't have the feet there, and I'll explain that in a minute, but the gold represents the Babylonian Empire. That's very clear in the text. This is Nebuchadnezzar, and this is 606 BC. We have this silver represented by uh, Persia, bronze, the Greek Empire, and iron was the Roman Empire to come. And you can see how these, these kingdoms came after the Babylonian Empire rule and reign. The first four kingdoms have been identified as Babylonian, Persian, Greek, and Roman empires. This identification comes from the workings of history matching with further prophecies. Daniel already said Babylon, specifically Nebuchadnezzar, uh, was the head of gold, Daniel 2.28. Babylonia uh, fell to the kingdom of the Persians, Daniel 5. 26 through 31. All of this is in history. It's recorded and it's also prophesied about. Now we have Greece becoming the successor to the Persian Empire in Daniel 8, 20 through 21, chapter 10, verse 20 uh, through chapter 11, verse 14. The Iron Empire can only be Rome. And I did not include the feet of the statue in this picture because the point of this message is not to get people into debating and arguing over the fifth empire, that is not what my uh, intention is with this message. I simply want to share with you the different viewpoints of what the fifth empire is believed to be, and you can study the Word of God out and draw your own conclusions. By the way, if the church is raptured before the Antichrist comes to power, this isn't something a believer needs to be concerned about to begin with, so I just want to point that out. So don't get stressed out in trying to identify the fifth empire. Some have tried to identify various periods in Europe's history as the clay and iron feet. Others claim that the feet represented the divided remnants of Rome uh, before supposedly being conquered by Christianity. Still others believe that clay iron empire is yet to come, that it is the kingdom of the Antichrist, that it will be a revived Roman empire. And this last theory, which seems to be uh, based off of Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 through 13, where the Antichrist will lead a coalition of 10 nations, which would represent the statue's 10 toes. And we know that Christ will defeat the forces of the Antichrist, Revelation 17, 14. So I tend to follow that last uh, theory. After that, Jesus will set up his kingdom, and we know that his kingdom will last and reign forever. He is the rock that smashes, smashes the image, the kingdoms of this world, and will become the kingdom of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ that will reign forever and ever, Revelation eleven fifteen. So the king's dream was a prophecy for end times for sure. We know this. But here's the outcome from the dream being interpreted by Daniel, chapter 2, verse 47. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and ministers, administrators over the province of Babylon while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. A lot more will happen to Daniel and the other three men. Nebuchadnezzar will go on to have more dreams. Jesus will appear in the fiery furnace and protect the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A hand will appear and write on a wall in chapter 5 where Daniel will once again read the writing on the wall that no one else can. And Daniel, for all that he has done, will end up in a lion's den 
where God will shut the mouths of the lions, where King Darius will discover for himself and say, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So it says, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Daniel prospered wherever he went because God was with him. Daniel himself will go on to have a dream and visions in chapter 7, and these are things that show us what will happen in the end times. Daniel is truly an amazing book. I encourage you to take some time out and read it yourself. I want to thank you once again for joining us in part two of the We Are the Dreamers series. Let's go ahead and finish up our time in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we went through that so quickly, but it really truly shows us where our wisdom comes from. Uh, Jesus is the wisdom of God, and he is with us always. And so we are going to encounter times in our lives where we're puzzled, confused, um, don't know what to do. And, and it might even become troubled, but we can allow the peace of God to reign in our hearts as we pray and we ask you for wisdom to reveal what we should do. And it says in your word in James 1, 5, that you will give us wisdom liberally and without reproach. And so, Lord, I just thank you for that. I thank you that we also know the truth that when you give us dreams, these God-given dreams, you will also provide an interpretation of those dreams. And so, Lord, if some of us are puzzled by the things that you've revealed in our hearts, may we begin to ask you for wisdom and an interpretation of these dreams. Uh, Lord, sometimes you'll send people our ways, our way that will interpret it for us. And Lord, I thank you that your plan is always a plan to expand the kingdom, a plan of salvation. And so in some way, the dreams that you give us will be about those things. Uh, Lord, I thank you that you're speaking to us all the time. And I'm really encouraged because after Daniel is put into a position of power, uh, Nebuchadnezzar will eventually die and others will come and, 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 and come to power. And then he'll be in trouble again. And so will the other three friends of his that were set up in a good position. But your favor went with them throughout their lives. And even in these troubling times, it really just opened the door for more and more people to come to know you and your salvation. And so we celebrate and we give you praise in all things. The bad things that come in our lives are not from you. It's the enemy bringing them about, but you're going to work good out of those things. You offer us your protection, your wisdom, uh, your peace, and your favor is upon us, so we do not need to worry. I thank you for this word today. I thank you for the ability to really kind of break it down uh, with your people. And I thank you for those that, that you led to this message today. We give you all the honor and the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.